in the United States, it's called Interred with Their Bones. And I'm published under the name Jennifer Lee Carroll. Uh-huh. In the UK and most other places in the world, it goes under the title The Shakespeare Secret. And I am J.L. Carroll. Because J.L. Carroll sounds closer to J.K. Rowling? Was that the, <laughs> was that the thing? Many people ask that. Hi, welcome. Thanks for streaming us or downloading and listening on your computer or MP3 player. Thanks for bringing us along. I'm Austin Tishner, one-third of the Reduced Shakespeare Company, and you're listening to this week's Reduced Shakespeare Company podcast, number 91, The Shakespeare Secret. In the almost two years of recording the Reduce Shakespeare Company podcast, we have talked to artists, authors, actors, and comedians, all of whom have either worked with us here at the Reduce Shakespeare Company or who we've met and come to know in our, in our travels. But not this week. This week, we're talking to an author that we don't know at all. A few months ago, I picked up a paperback book in London called The Shakespeare Secret. It's a novel, and I really enjoyed it. It's a page-turner about a character named Kate Stanley and her search for a lost Shakespeare manuscript and the clues to Shakespeare's actual identity and all the actual Shakespearean history, plus the various corpses and red herrings she discovers along the way, is all part of the fun. It's a perfect plain read or a beach read or even just a weekend escape. The author is a woman named Jennifer Lee Carroll, and I was able to track her down via her MySpace page. So, thanks to the power of the internet and the magic of Skype, Jennifer leapt at the chance to speak to the dozens of Reduced Shakespeare Company podcast listeners. And she started by explaining why her UK publisher wanted her listed as J.L. Carroll in the UK. As my British publisher put it, it makes me sound less American and more British. What I actually think it makes me sound in Britain is less female and more male. I picked this, I picked up The Shakespeare Secret uh, in Borders on Oxford Street in London. I was flying, okay. flying home the next day looking for something to read, and I saw the title The Shakespeare Secret. It says, A Modern Serial Killer Hunting an Ancient Secret. And I looked at the things on the back, and I thought, well, this sounds like the Da Vinci Code, but with Shakespeare. That sounds like fun to me. Uh, and it certainly was fun. Do you, do you like that comparison to the Da Vinci Code? You know, that's a, it's a double-edged sword. I bet. Um, you know, it, it's certainly not a problem to be, you know, compared to, to one of the greatest selling books of all time. Certainly, if it makes people pick it up, I like that. And it is. It's a treasure hunt thriller, and so is the Da Vinci Code. Mm -hmm. But there are people out there who really dislike the Da Vinci Code, and I would hate to have them discount this book thinking it is just like it. Well, it is definitely... Because in many ways it's different. It it is different in many ways. One of the most significant ways in which it's different is that it's more well-written. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I mean, the, sto- the, the story is compelling. It's a page turner. It's everything you want in an airplane read. But also, if you're a fan of Shakespeare, uh, uh, it's just it's just uh, got all this great stuff that you can dig into. And we can talk about the plot a little bit. But did you set out to write a thriller? Um, it actually surprised me that my first novel turned out to be a thriller. What happened was I had the idea first. I had the idea very early on in graduate school, which is a long time ago now, so this was right around 1980, 1990, when I first discovered that there actually were lost plays by Shakespeare. Um, And I, you know, the moment I discovered that, I was in the English department library at Harvard, and it was this autumn night, and you could see, you know, the moonlight coming through the big windows, and I was in in a back room going through some old books that people don't look at much. And I pulled one off the shelf, which happened to show up in, in the novel um, called The Elizabethan Stage by E.K. Chambers, um, and discovered this. And I remember sitting back on my heels and thinking, that is really amazing. What would it be like to find one of these things? Mm. And from that instant on, I started fantasizing about what it would be like to find one. And I had myself in the center of it at the time, you know. Right. <laughs> um, thinking about, you know, where would I find it? What would it be like? You know, how would it change my life? Apart from the obvious uh, 
the obvious well, consequence that I'd never have to work again. Yes, and, um, and, and you would leave an unfortunate trail of corpses in your wake. <laughs> well, you know, you when, you when you start, well, eventually I realized that, in fact, I was never going to find one of the last plays by Shakespeare. So, and that it might be really much more fun to make into a novel in any case, because then, you know, and this is the novelist's dirty secret, then I could control it. I could yeah. control where it would be found and who did it and what would happen. I started to think about it very early on as a as a book, and one of the first things you have to decide when you set out to um, you know take a take just a, a sentence idea and move it into a book is what's the genre going to be, and with something that rare and that precious, it very early on started to seem like it might be a kind of treasure hunt story, um, and you know then it kind of begs to be a a thriller or a murder mystery. So I had that in the back of my head for a long time. And by the time I actually got around to writing it, um, which was 2006, um, by then, you know, The Da Vinci Code <laughs> was one of the greatest sellers of all time, which really helped me to sell the book. But it wasn't what influenced my decision to make it a thriller. Does that make any sense? It does. It makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it was It was clearly well on your way in your head for, for, for many years. Now, but were you always a novelist or did you, or, or, or let me ask the other question. Were you always a Shakespearean or was this discovering this Chambers book, a kind of a stumble into Shakespeareana? Oh no. I, uh, I've loved Shakespeare since I was small and I was, I found out about, um, about these lost plays when I was starting a PhD in English literature with the intention of becoming a professor of Shakespeare or a professor of Renaissance literature. So, um, so I've loved Shakespeare for a long time, and at least for a while, I was intending to, you know, be a professional Shakespearean in the academic sense. Um, and during that time, when I was in grad school, I started collecting all this Shakespearean trivia that was odd, <laughs> wacky in a lot of ways. Both, you know, the the alternate author uh, controversies, and then just weird ideas people have had about Shakespeare through the mm -hmm. centuries. Um, some of this stuff, at the, at the time, you still couldn't really talk about in academic circles. It was pretty taboo. Um, but I was just fascinated by it, so I, I collected it, just uh, not knowing what exactly I was going to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, uh, and then I decided that when I really sat down to start this novel, I decided it would be a place to really bring out a lot of this stuff that I had so much fun with. Well, and then you kind of alluded to this earlier, and, and, and this is the dopiest question an, an author can be asked, but how much of the book is autobiographical? <laughs> I don't ask that a lot. You I, know, I know Kate, you are. The and heroine. It's... I know. It's fine. I'm asking if Kate the heroine is me. Um, what I usually say is that, and, and this might frighten you, you know, all of those characters are me, including the killer. See, that's the answer. Um, that is always the answer. So yes, she's me, and she and she, you know, in a sense, and she does have some, you know, some past history that is like mine. She's a she's an ex Shakespearean academic. When I left academics, I I sort of came to a fork in the road, and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to pursue theater or if I wanted to pursue writing, but I knew I wanted to do one of those two things. Is what actually pushed me out of being an academic. I, I either wanted to make novels and stories, or I wanted to pursue Shakespeare in the theater. So I gave Kate, you know, the road untraveled. I went the way of writing, and I gave her the the road towards theater. And, and so in a way, you know, she's an alter ego, and yeah, she does all the things you're you can't you can't do. You're not allowed to do. Right. Yeah. And did you go to the did you go to all the places the settings in your novel? Did you do that research? Yeah. That must have been the most Which, fun part. It was. Great. I mean, it was amazing. I met some amazing people. I had a lot of help, and it was, boy, you know, some of those places were, and they're they're extraordinary. Many of them I had known before, mm -hmm. like Stratford and the Globe in London. But when you are going as a tourist and you're just enjoying something, you pay attention to it in a very different way than than when you're thinking, I'm going to build a chase scene here, and how am I going to get you know this person from this place to that place without being seen or, you know, how am I going to burn the globe down or something like that. <laughs> well, yeah, an another thing you're not allowed to do in real life.
Did you do all this on your own? Did you get an advance from your publisher to do this? How did that all work? One of the very nice uh, results of of having some kind of comparison to Dan Brown uh-huh. and and his success behind it is that um, unusually for a first time novelist, I was able to sell this book as an idea uh, and then right. write it. Right. So I did have an advance, and that that helped a lot. And you know, and then I had a, a publisher's backing so that when I would write people and say I'm, I'm working on this novel I could get you know I, I could get a letter of introduction if need be from a publisher uh, uh, but you know I have to say I, I had they gave me a great backstage tour through the globe I got to watch a, a rehearsal you know a performance in rehearsal and, um, and I was quite upfront about what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> Poor woman who was taking me on the tour kept, she looked really white faced when I told her I was going to burn the place down. She kept saying, Do you really need to do that? <laughs> well, and the, and the book does go all over the place. That's what's fun about it. I mean, unfortunately, you have a character who has access to a private jet, but you know, you go from England to France to Washington, D.C., and then oddly enough to the American Southwest, which I thought was a wonderful detour and maybe a surprise I've just given it away. But. You know, I found that to be a lovely surprise in in the course of this story about Shakespeare. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, again, that was part of of the the strange trivia I'd collected about Shakespeare was his great popularity among miners and cowboys uh, and all kinds of people in the Wild West of the United States. Um, and you know, weird connections some of the controversial theories of Shakespeare have with places like like Valladolid in Spain. Mm -hmm. So I I wanted to, when when I was very early on constructing how the plot would go, I wanted to include all of these places. Um, And that is why I contacted a person with a private jet. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't exactly make make Kate come over on the Queen Mary or something. A a two-week travel across the Atlantic doesn't do much for a thriller. (laughs) No, it sure doesn't. Um... (laughs) And now, do you uh, do you have a day job, or, or, or are you a full-time novelist now? I'm a full-time novelist. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a dream come true. In our fake bibliography, we actually uh, wrote, we actually included Dan Brown's book, The Shakespeare Code, in, <laughs> in, which, in which Catholic priests cover up the true identity of, of William Shakespeare. Oh, that's wonderful! And so that was—it was an extra added treat that uh, to, to to discover this book and went, "Hey, somebody actually did it." You know, fiction really approaches reality sometimes in weird ways. There's a scene in my book that's set in Spain in the in a seminary that called the Royal English College, and I did go there because um, I wanted it. You know, I wanted the scene to be accurate, but I never met the rector of the college. I just. You know, made that character up. Uh-huh. But I've since been told by many people that my character looks and sounds like the actual rector of that college. Wow. Isn't that wow. weird? No, that synchronicity, it was, all, it was all meant to be. Are there more adventures in store for Kate Stanley? More, uh, yes. more treasure hunts? Or, and are they Shakespeare related? Uh, yes, she's, um, I've, I've got her on one at the moment. It's um, due out in, we think, fall 2009. Um, and in this one, it you know it's all about the Scottish play and the legendary curse on the on the play Macbeth. Um, so Kate is directing directing that play, and all manner of mayhem starts to happen. <laughs> so it's clearly a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and again, it's a way of collecting a lot of very very odd, um, very enticing stories that people have from history about about strange occurrences around this play. Right. Collect them all together and put them in a book. Well, and you've got and you've got a great heroine, and uh, uh, I'm excited that there will be more adventures under various titles and authorial credits uh, in around the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. You know, it, it's kind of amazing to me that that it uh, took off this way, but um, it's certainly a an adventurous ride. Well, Jennifer, it's absolutely great talking to you. I'm so glad to finally meet you, and, and, and I'm amazed at the uh, at the power of the internet that I can track you down via MySpace and that we can do this. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. It is. All right, well, thanks very much. 
That's it for this week's Reduce Shakespeare Company podcast. If you have uncovered a lost Shakespeare manuscript, or anything else for that matter, send your feedback and questions via email to feedback at reducedshakespeare.com or leave us a message on our MySpace page at myspace.com slash reduced Shakespeare. You can also find us at facebook.com. Thanks as always to webmaster Matt Rippey, ripsite.co.uk, member of the original cast of Coriolanus the Musical Matthew Croak, music by John Weber and Garage Band. Our random fan shout out this week goes to Debbie Caldwell. No reason, it is just random. Special thanks to RSC fan Sarah, better known as Rabid Psycho, and thanks to Jennifer Lee Carroll, whose book, Interred with Their Bones, comes out in paperback this week in the United States. For more information about Jennifer or her books, go to her websites, jenniferleecarroll.com. That's Jennifer with two N's, Lee with two E's, and Carroll with two R's and two L's or shakespearesecret.com. Thanks very much for listening. I'm Austin Titchener, 91 to 173rds of the Reduced Shakespeare Company. Yeah, no, it actually um, hit the extended New York Times bestseller list. It's hardcover. Oh, fantastic. Good for you. Thank you. I, 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 have, I, I don't know you at all, and I, yet I have this oddly paternal pride in, what, in your accomplishment. Good for you. <laughs> Podcast is a production of the Reduce Shakespeare Company. Reducing expectations since 1981. Go to ReduceShakespeare.com for performance dates, actor bios, email newsletters, and so much less. And so much less. And so much less.